Well, let's open our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Uh, we're still in the second major section of the book, chapters 4 through 6, that is very practical. It deals with our duties to Christ. In fact, this entire section is categorized or looked at in light of one word, the word walk. The word carries the idea of the life we live as Christians, our Christian walk, we would say. And so far, we've looked at four separate aspects of our walk as believers. Paul told us to walk in a worthy manner. He said to walk in a different manner, to walk in a loving manner, and to walk in a lighted manner, if you will. And last time we were together, we said if we were walking in love and walking in light, it's going to be seen in our lives. There's going to be a noticeable change or transformation in our lives as it pertains to what we do and where we go. Now, it certainly doesn't mean that we're perfect, but we saw three separate aspects of what would result from walking in love and walking in light. We saw that we'll give thanks to the Lord, we'll be set apart for the Lord, and we'll bear fruit unto the Lord. Well, this brings us to verse 15 of Ephesians chapter 5, where Paul is going to deal with one more aspect of our walk. And that involves the fact that we should walk circumspectly. So let's pick up our reading in verse 15, uh, reading down through verse 21 in our study today. Ephesians chapter 5, beginning in verse 15. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of of God. Now, while there's not very many verses we'll be looking at in our study today, there is quite a bit of information there. And it all starts, it all begins with an imperative or a command. And that, of course, is seen in verse 15, to walk circumspectly. Take a look. Back in Ephesians 5.15, Paul said, see then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Now, we've talked about the word walk in our last few studies, it carries the idea of the life we live as a believer, our Christian walk. The word circumspectly means diligent, accurate, or careful. We might say in our modern day vernacular, watch your step. <laughs> watch your step. Now, we watch our step, physically speaking, do we not? We don't walk as fools, we walk as wise, because if we're walking as fools, we walk with our eyes shut. But if we're walking as wise, we walk with our eyes open so we can watch our steps, so we can see clearly where we're going, physically speaking. Now, if that is true for us physically, it should be equally true for us spiritually. We need to keep our spiritual eyes open, we might say, to see where we're going or to see where we're walking or ultimately what kind of life we are living. Now, as it pertains to this idea of walking circumspectly, as it pertains to our spiritual well-being, there are many things we can look at and learn about. But in our text, Paul gives us three things, if you're taking notes or outlining our study today, three things we need to look at regarding walking circumspectly. Number one, if we're walking circumspectly, number one, it involves redeeming the time. Redeeming the time. Take a look at verse 16. Paul says, redeeming the time because the days are evil. If we're walking circumspectly, if we're watching our step, we're going to redeem the time. The word redeem is only used four times in the entire New Testament. This particular word, it means to purchase back or to buy the ransom. Uh, 
Now the word time is not the typical word for time, the word chronos, which speaks of a moment in time. It's a much different word, it's the word kairos. It means an epoch of time or a season of time. And the point for us is pretty simple. It speaks of purchasing or obtaining every moment of time in our lives as it pertains to telling people about Jesus. I mean, that's redeeming the time for you and for me. If we're walking circumspectly, if we're walking in a spiritual realm, we might say, if we're walking in light of the spiritual aspect of who we are and what life's all about, we're going to look for each and every opportunity when we go to work, when we're at school, when we're on vacation, when we're in the community, when we're at the store, no matter where we're at, what we're into or what we're up to, we're going to be looking for every opportunity possible to tell as many men and women and boys and girls about Jesus as we possibly can. Because ultimately, that's what life's all about. I mean, look, we get this question often, do we not? What is life all about? I mean, my alarm goes off at 4.30 in the morning. I get up, I drive two hours, I work 12 hours, I drive two more hours home, I eat dinner, I go to bed, and my alarm goes off again. I mean, what in the world is life all about? Does anybody understand what we're talking about? First service had no idea. They're all retired. But no matter where we're at or what we're into or what we're up to, man, it's, life is all about telling people about Jesus. Why has God blessed you with that job? Well, it's so that you can use it as a mission field to tell others about Jesus. It's about getting as many men and women and boys and girls to heaven as possible. And if we're walking circumspectly, we're going to understand that if we're going to watch our step, this is, in, you know, yesterday, uh, we were with Brother Jeff Jetton. Uh, he heads up the three-in-one ministry here uh, for the motocross ministry. Uh, we were out at the motorcycle races, Sally and I, watching Shane McElrath and, and Mitchell and a few others race. And it was just a glorious time. And it was just, it, it, we walked up this incredibly steep hill up to this tent up here where the Troy Lee um, Design Center was. They had a tent and food and whatnot. So we got a bird's eye view of the race. And it, but coming down was pretty, pretty steep. And it was so funny because I was telling Sally, now, honey, watch your step. Watch your step. It's really steep. It's loose gravel. Don't fall, you know. So I'm holding on to her. And so what happens? I didn't quite fall. But I slipped. <laughs> and I almost fell. And she turned and looked at me and she said, look, don't hold on to me because if you go down, you're going to take me with you. So she was walking circumspectly. And if we're walking circumspectly, if we're watching our steps spiritually, we're going to look for every opportunity. We're going to redeem or purchase back every opportunity we can to tell people about Jesus. And you know, it was so neat yesterday with Brother Jeff there in the pits with the KTM crew and the Kawasaki groups. I mean, it was a big deal. And he was just praying with these guys and reaching out to them and loving on them. And it was just a glorious thing. Sure, were we having fun? Were we out at the races? Absolutely. We had a great time. But you know, he was redeeming the time in telling people about Jesus. It was, it was just awesome. But note carefully, class, why we're to redeem the time at the end of verse 16. It says, because the days are evil. I think we can all agree that the days are evil. Man, evil men and imposters are waxing worse and worse. Uh, we are seeing evil today like no other time. I mean, they're even writing laws saying it's okay to do what's evil. God help us all. And I think in our modern way of thinking of these days being evil, it carries the idea that time is short. Time is short. James 4.14 says, our life's a vapor. We're here today. We're gone tomorrow. So the question is, how are we walking? If we're truly walking circumspectly as believers, if we're watching our steps spiritually, we're going to be redeeming the time because we understand the days are evil. The days are short and there's not much time left. Back to Ephesians chapter 5. Let's come to the second thing. <clears throat> Excuse me. The second thing that's involved in walking circumspectly. Number one, it results in redeeming the time. But second, it involves the will of the Lord. The will of the Lord. Uh, take a look at verse 17 in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 17. 
Paul says, therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. The word understand is also translated wise. So Paul is making a pretty powerful point here. He's saying, don't be unwise, but be wise. How? By knowing the will of the Lord. And apparently this is a pretty important issue. I mean, hey, after all, does anybody desire to be wise? <laughs> You're okay, three of you up in the front, good. Because if we de desire to be wise, we have to know the will of the Lord. And when we're talking about the will of God, we, of course, can talk about that for several months on end. There's no doubt the Bible's replete in dealing with this topic. But we would simply mention two things about the will of God for each and every one of us today. I think the first thing involves his specific will. His specific will. How can we know exactly what God's specific will is for us individually? Well, it's easy, by knowing the word of God. To know God's specific will, we need to know his specific word, <laughs> his perfect word. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 4.3 says, This is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality. That's pretty specific. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God. 1 Peter 2.15, this is the will of God that by doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. 1 Peter 4.2, it is the will of God we do not live after the flesh. 1 John 2.17, if we do the will of God we abide forever. You say, okay, Clark, I get it. We need to know the word of God if we want to know the will of God, especially as it pertains to his specific will. And that's why we place such great importance on teaching the Bible. We don't just talk about the Bible or deal with random topics in the Bible. We teach the totality of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. So we get the whole counsel of God. So we understand the will of God in each and every aspect of our lives specifically, exactly as it pertains to what we should or should not do. But there's a second aspect of God's will we should probably look at, and that involves his perfect will, his perfect will. I'd like you to turn over to Romans chapter 12 for just a moment, if you would, please. Romans chapter 12, because it's important for all of us to know God's perfect will. We might even call it his general will for our life. I mean... I want to know exactly what God wants me to do as it pertains to general issues in life, things that aren't not necessarily specifically addressed in Scripture. Like, for instance, should I take this job or that job? Should I buy this house or that house? Marry this spouse or that spouse? You follow me? There's a lot of different decisions that all of us have to make in our life. And chances are we all want to be in God's perfect will as it pertains to the decisions that we have to make. So the question is, what's involved in falling in line with God's perfect will for our lives? Are you ready for this? It involves two things. It involves our bodies and our minds. Our bodies and minds, you say, oh yes. Look at verse 1 of Romans chapter 12. Paul said, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Why? That you may prove or know what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And the idea is, if we're living for the Lord with our bodies in verse 1, and we're thinking about the Lord with our minds in verse 2, we're going to be directed by the Lord. He's going to bring us into his perfect will. Now, there's probably one thing we should mention about living for the Lord and thinking about the Lord as we're being directed by the Lord. As we are directed by God into 
his perfect will regarding choosing A or B, whatever the choice may be, it might not necessarily lead us from point A to point B right away. In other words, God might get us to point B, which of course is his perfect will where he wants us to be, but it might not be a straight shot. He might take us the circuitous route, the arduous route. Why? Well, because where would be the faith? If he took us from point A to point B with a straight direct shot with one step, where would be the faith? We can just take 1 Corinthians 5, 7 right out of the Bible that we're to walk by faith and not by sight. Yeah. So will we eventually get to point B, which represents God's perfect will in our life? Oh, yes. The children of Israel went from Kadesh Barnea to the promised land, which is only a, a, a one-day journey. But it took them 40 years. Was God leading them the whole way? Absolutely, with a pillar of fire by day and a pillar of cloud by night, or pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Oh, he was leading them. And he was getting them from point A to point B according to his perfect will. You know, I just assumed God would take me from point A to point B the quickest, safest, and easiest route. But he doesn't do that. Why? Well, because he wants us to put our faith in him. Look at the disciples. Jesus told them, get into the boat for we are going to the other side. <laughs> he didn't say it was going to be smooth sailing. He didn't say it was going to be the direct path. Oh, it was a long, hard journey, a lot of storm, a lot of water, a lot of wind, a lot of waves. But did they make it to the other side? The answer is yes. And so too it is with us. So there's a balance in all of this. Yes, we live for the Lord. Yes, we think about the Lord. Yes, we're going to be directed by the Lord. But please don't think he's going to take us immediately from point A to point B. Sometimes it might take a while. But know this, precious family, when it takes a while, it's for our benefit. It's for our growth. It's to strengthen us, to stretch us, to mature us, to cause us to put all of our faith in him to get us to where he wants us to go so that we would subsequently finish according to his perfect will. Back to Ephesians chapter 5. Let's come to a third and final thing that's involved in walking circumspectly. It involves redeeming the time. Number two, it involves the will of the Lord. And number three and finally, it involves being filled with the Spirit. Being filled with the Spirit. That's in verses 18 through 21. And Paul begins this third and final point in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 18 by way of contrast. Contrast, take a look. In verse 18, he says, and do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but, here's the contrast, be filled with the Spirit. Now, let's take a look at the first part of this verse when he says, do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation. The word dissipation, only used three times in the entire New Testament, means depravity, debauchery, riotousness, if you will. I'd like you to turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 for just a moment, if you would, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Because you can well imagine that over the years, many people have come up and said, Hey, Pastor, is it okay for me to drink alcohol? <laughs> and I'll usually say, Well, if you have to ask, you pretty much know the answer. You know what I'm saying? Anytime you have to ask somebody something, the answer is usually no. But my response raises quite a few eyebrows because they'll say, is it okay for me to drink alcohol? I'll say, sure you can. You can do whatever you want to do. And they say, really? Can I? Their eyes light up. They get a little grin on their face and they think everything is fine. And then, of course, the other shoe drops. I'll say, yes, you can do whatever you want to do. But that's not the question. The question is not can I, but should I? Ah, there's the rub. Should I do this? Should I do that? Should I go here? Should I go there? 
Now, before we do or say anything, we should ask ourselves at least four questions. Four questions. Number one, is it helpful? Is what I'm about to do, where I'm about to go, the thing I'm about to see or say or hear or ingest, is it helpful? Drop down to verse 12 of 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12. Paul said, all things are lawful for me. In other words, I can do whatever I want. But all things are not helpful. The word helpful is profitable. Is it going to profit me, spiritually speaking? Is it going to help me in my walk with the Lord, to walk circumspectly? So the first question we should ask, is it helpful? Number two. The second question, is it addictive? Is it addictive? Take a look at the end of verse 12 in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. It says, all things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power or the bondage of any. Is what I'm about to do going to bring me under its power? Is it going to bring me into bondage? Is it addictive, if you will? Every year around Christmas time, Oreo cookies come out with, <laughs> with those that are covered in white fudge. You know the white fudge Oreo, you know the ones we're talking about? It's sin in a box. <laughs> I, I'm convinced. Because I cannot eat just one. I have to eat the whole box and I'm sick for two days and I don't care. Now, for me, those are sin. I can't have them. Clark, it's a cookie. Come on. <clears throat> oh, it's a cookie to you. <laughs> it's addictive for me. Follow me? Yeah. So it's not about the actual product. We, we kind of get off track with that. Well, come on. That's really not bad. Oh, yes, it is. And we can plug in any variable, <clears throat> variable, by the way, alcohol, gambling, cigarettes, drugs, food, this, that, the, follow me? Hey, this is serious. If it brings me under its power, it's wrong, and Satan can use that, and we all need to be very careful. Now, there's a third thing we should ask ourselves. Does it stumble? Is it stumbling others? Turn over to chapter 8, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, one page to the right. <clears throat> Excuse me. Look at verse 9. In verse 9 of 1 Corinthians chapter 8, Paul said, but food, or verse 9, excuse me, he said, but beware, 1 Corinthians 8, 9, beware, lest somehow this liberty, this freedom of yours has become a, <clears throat> excuse me, one second. <clears throat> Let me get a drink of water here. Never mind. We can... <laughs> oh, bless you. Thank you, Sean. You're a good man. Was that your wife's? <clears throat> You're such a giver. <laughs> Thank you, Caprice. Okay. <laughs> You just took that right from her and brought it up, didn't you? Okay. Bologna sandwiches for you today. Now, look at verse 9. It says, Beware, somehow, lest this liberty of yours becomes a stumbling block to those who are weak. Have you ever, have you ever had anybody say, Well, if, that's, if they're stumbled by what I do, that's their problem. Because I've got freedom. I have liberty in Christ to do this, to do that. Oh, Really? You know, the Bible says just the opposite. The Bible says it's sin. And if anybody brings me a box of white fudge Oreo cookies for Christmas, you're in sin. You need to repent and get right with God. Roman, okay, maybe a couple of boxes. <laughs> just kidding. Romans 14.21 says, It is good neither to eat meat nor drink wine, nor do anything by which your brother stumbles. Wow, pretty powerful. Let's come to a fourth and final question. 
And that is, is it glorifying? Is it glorifying? Turn over to chapter 10, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Look at verse 31. In 1 Corinthians 10, 31, Paul said, Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Is what we're about to do, where we're about to go, the thing we're about to see or say or be involved with, does it bring glory to God? And this is something all of us need to be very careful regarding. You know, I like what Pastor Chuck used to say. He said that anything that alters our state of consciousness opens the door for the attack of the enemy. And there's a lot of truth to that. You know, over the last 20 some odd years, I've never had one person, not once, come into my office and say, Pastor, since I started drinking booze, my life is so awesome. I mean, my job, my family, my health. I mean, this is, I I wish I would have known about alcohol long ago. (laughs) You know, I've never had one person say that. But I can't tell you the countless number of people that have come into my office and tell me that their entire life is destroyed. They've lost their job. They've lost their family. They've lost their health. Are all things lawful? Oh, yes. I can do whatever I want. That's not the question. The question is, should we? Back to Ephesians chapter 5. Now, here's the contrast. We said verse 18 was a huge contrast. At the end of verse 18, back in Ephesians 5, it says, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, the verb filled is a present imperative. We are commanded to continually, repetitively be filled with the Holy Spirit. This speaks of the overflowing of the Holy Spirit, the baptism with the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 2, in Acts chapter 4, in Acts chapter 6, we see the disciples were constantly being filled with the Spirit because it, the The work of God's Holy Spirit is what will empower us and enable us to bring glory to Him. It's also in the passive voice being filled with the Spirit, which indicates an action we receive. It's something that Jesus Christ does in us and upon us. And I think if we can put verse 18 together in one simple thought, it's pretty simple. Don't be intoxicated with the things of the world, whatever they may be but we're to be intoxicated with the Spirit of God because ultimately something is controlling our lives. And either we are being controlled by the world or we're being controlled by the Word, not both. Jesus said, you're for me or against me. Look, there's no middle ground. There's no sitting on the fence. There's no straddling some imaginary line. No, we have a choice to make. Now, if we're truly controlled by the Spirit, if we're filled with the Spirit, it's going to result in a great many things in our lives. There's no doubt about that. But there are four very specific things that Paul mentions in verses 19 through 21. Note them carefully. If we're filled with the Spirit, it'll result in how we speak to others. How we speak to others. Look at verse 19. It says, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual psalms. If we're truly filled with the Spirit, our speech will be centered on Jesus Christ. We're going to be talking about spiritual things, we might say. Now, I like how the Living Bible puts it. It says, talk with each other much about the Lord, quoting psalms, hymns, and sacred songs. In other words, our conversations are to be centered on spiritual things. Now, clearly, Paul is not saying that we should all sell our homes, quit our jobs, move to the mountains and sing Kumbaya all day long, though I'm not opposed to that. What he is saying is even when we are dealing with secular issues, and we all deal with secular issues, we have vehicles and food and we have worldly issues that we talk about and have to deal with on a daily basis. 
The point is, even when we're dealing with secular things, whether it be work or whatever, we need to approach it in a spiritual manner. In other words, our communication with other people is going to be edifying. It's not going to be harsh or crass or worldly. Uh, we're not going to use the same language they use, the same terminology they use. We're going to be speaking in a different way, even when we talk about secular things, if we're truly filled with the Spirit. Number two. The second thing involves singing to ourselves, not just speaking with others, but singing to ourselves. Take a look at verse 19 again. At the end of the verse, it says, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Now, I'm glad it says we're singing in our heart the way... (laughs) The way I sing, uh, I love to sing, I love to worship the Lord, but ultimately this all points to and speaks of the attitude of the heart. It speaks of what's going on inside us, no matter what's going on outside of us, no matter what situation or circumstance we're in. Man, there's there's an internal joy, we're singing, we're making melody in our heart to the Lord. There's an internal joy peace and rest and tranquility and ultimately a joy. Isaiah 65, 14 says, my servants will sing out of the joy of their hearts. It's that internal joy. You know, I'll never forget when I was in Israel on one of our tours, the fellow who owns the tour company, Colonel Shalom Almog, a full bird colonel in the IDF, He approached me one evening in the lobby of the hotel there in Jerusalem. He said, "Uh, Clark, can I talk to you for a moment? I said, sure. He said, you know, I've been looking at you and the group that you're leading over here from Calvary Chapel. And he goes, I'm really jealous of what you guys have. I said, well, it's interesting you say that because the Bible talks quite a bit about that. He says, I want that same happiness that you guys have. And I said, well, you know, Shalom, uh, you're pretty close, but no cigar. He said, what do you mean? I said, what you're seeing in us and the group isn't happiness, it's joy. And I explained to him that happiness is from an old English word, happenstance. In other other words, if things are going good, I'm up. (laughs) If things are going bad, I'm down. That's happiness. It comes and goes. But I told him, joy, ah, joy comes from the Lord. And the joy that we have from Jesus Christ is in spite of our circumstances because it comes from inside the heart that no matter what we're going through, no matter what we're dealing with, we can sing and have a melody in our heart to the Lord. And I had a wonderful opportunity to lead that man who's a battle-hardened veteran in the Israeli Defense Force, fought in the 1967 war, the Six-Day War, and many others, had a wonderful opportunity to lead him into faith in Jesus Christ. And what a glorious thing for him to be able to receive the joy of the Lord. And if we're filled with the Spirit, man, we're not going to be intoxicated with the things of the world. We're going to have joy, and that is a work of the Spirit. Number three, let's come to the third thing that is the byproduct of being filled with the Spirit, and I like this one. It involves giving thanks, giving thanks. Look at verse 20. In Ephesians 5.20, Paul said, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the point is, if we're truly controlled by the Spirit, if we're being filled with the Spirit, we're going to give thanks by the Spirit. Not just once in a while, not just in certain circumstances or situation, but note carefully in verse 20, it says, giving thanks always for all things, whether we put it in category good or category bad. And that must be a work of the Spirit. Because if we truly believe that God is in absolute total control of everything and everyone all the time, no matter what we're dealing with or what we're going through, and as unpleasant as it may be, 
we ultimately can give thanks. Maybe not for the situation we're in, but we can give thanks knowing He's going to get us through the situation we're in and that He's going to use it to grow us, to mature us, to stretch us, to bring us to a place where He wants us to be. And therefore, in all things, all, all the time, we can say, Lord, thank you. As 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, Give thanks always in all things, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Let's come to the fourth and final thing, and we'll wrap this up right here. The fourth and final byproduct of being filled with the Spirit, and you might not like this one, it involves submitting. Submitting. Take a look at verse 21. Paul said, submitting to one another in the fear, or we might say the reverential awe of God. The word submitting, hupotasso, is a military term. It means to be put under or in subjection to, or we might even say fall in line, as it were. And it carries the idea of relinquishing our will to the will of those who are over us, the one who is above us, the one who is in control of us. And this is something that goes against our grain naturally. This rubs us all the wrong way, does it not? Submitting to someone else? (laughs) You know, I'll never forget when my granddaughter was a very young girl. She was over at our house and playing, and I kind of got on her a little bit. I said, now, McKenna, don't do that. And she put her little hands on her hips, and she said, Grandpa, you not to boss of me. I said, what? My mommy and daddy said, they're the boss of me. And I said, oh, okay, okay. I said, well, McKenna, you are right. Your mommy and daddy are the boss of you, but I'm the boss of them. (laughs) She said, oh, you the big boss. (laughs) She got the picture. But this is something that grinds us all the wrong way. Because nobody likes to submit to other people. And so therefore, it must be a work of God's Holy Spirit in our life, humbling us, bringing us to a place of humility so we can say, okay, I'm going to put you first. And ultimately, submitting to one another is really putting others first. Looking out for the interest of others, as Paul said in Philippians chapter 2, verses 3, 4, and 5. And what a beautiful picture we see of going back to verse 18, to being filled with the Spirit. And being filled with the Spirit, although it happens once at the point of salvation, the Holy Spirit indwells us the moment we're saved. Uh, We saw that in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. We're sealed by the Holy Spirit as the guarantee of our inheritance, of our eternal life. Being filled with the Holy Spirit, the overflowing of the Holy Spirit, the baptism with the Holy Spirit is something that we need each and every day in our lives to enable us and empower us to live a life that brings glory to God. Well, Lord willing, next week, we're going to continue to look at this idea of submission Paul is going to further elaborate on this idea of being submitting one to another, and he's going to deal with three separate areas. He's going to deal with marriages, he's going to deal with families, and he's going to deal with businesses as we go into chapter 6. So if this idea of submission rubs you the wrong way, um, for the next three weeks, you might want to stay home. So... Father, we do thank you. Lord, we thank you for your work, your word. We thank you for your spirit. We thank you for these few short minutes that you've given us to be able to come and gather together. And Lord, we just cry out to you with great need for your spirit to come upon us every moment of every day. For each and every aspect of these things that we looked at and learned about in our study today. Because, Lord, we recognize that these are not things we do in and of ourselves. In fact, (laughs) it's just the opposite of what we would do normally, naturally in the flesh. 
So, Lord, we cry out to you for your spirit to help us, to empower us, to enable us to do that which you have commanded us. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Shall we all stand together? If you need prayer today for anything at all, be sure to come on up. At the end of the service, the pastors and the brothers and the sisters, they'll be up front to pray with you, to pray for you, to serve you, to love you, just to minister to any need you may have in your lives today. And I do pray that as you begin this first day of the new week, that God's spirit would fall upon you in a very fresh and powerful way, that he would strengthen you and use you, that he would shine brightly through each and every one of you. God bless you guys. I love you so much. Have a, have a great week in Jesus.